In the year 161 AC, news reached King's Landing of King Daron I's death at the young age of 18 in the Red Sands of Dawn after being murdered while meeting under a peace banner to negotiate with the Dornish rebels. At the death of the young dragon, his remaining forces routed, with very few ever making it back across the Dornish border. While the Dornish had always been a thorn in the side of the kings of House Targaryen and had always used unconventional tactics in times of war, the young dragon never believed he would be killed whilst treating under a peace banner. The outrage at the death of King Daron was swiftly directed at the Dornish hostages in King's Landing, taken from every great house in Dorn to ensure the Dornish stayed loyal to House Targaryen. At the command of the Hand of the King, Prince Viserys, every single one of them was thrown into the dark dungeons of the Red Keep, where they would wait for their inevitable executions. With a death as high profile as the King himself, no mercy could be shown to the hostages, no matter how innocent they were in the actions of their countrymen. The Hand's eldest son, Prince Aegon, even delivered the Dornish girl he had made his paramour to his father to await execution without a second thought or moment of hesitation. The issue that faced the Hand is that King Daron, in his short life, was so focused on war and the conquest of Dawn that he never had the time or opportunity to marry, nor father any children. It is thought he never even fathered baseborn children. Thus accordingly, upon his death, the Iron Throne passed to his younger brother, Baelor, a youth of 17 years of age, born in the year 144 AC. Prince Baelor proved to be the most pious prince and then king, the Seven Kingdoms of Westeros, and the Targaryen dynasty ever saw. His first act as king was to grant pardons to the Dornish hostages, much to the outrage of many at court. Many similar acts of piety and forgiveness followed throughout Baelor's reign, even as his lords and counsellors cried for vengeance. Baelor publicly forgave his brother's killers and declared that he meant to bind up the wounds of his brother's war and make peace with Dawn. As an act of piety, he declared he would go to Dawn himself with neither a sword nor an army, to return the hostages and sue for peace. And so he did, walking barefoot from King's Landing to Sunspear, clad in only a sackcloth, whilst the hostages rode fine horses behind him. Many thought his mission to dawn suicide, and there were some suggestions among the lords at court that they make plans for the succession in the seemingly likely event of the death of the king. There were many songs of Baelor's journey to Dawn that found their way out of septuaries and mother houses to spill from the tongues of singers. Mounting the stoneway, it is said Baelor soon came to the place where the Wills had imprisoned his cousin, Prince Aemon, who was with King Daron when he was murdered. He found the Dragon Knight naked in a cage, thin and ragged. It is said that Baelor pleaded, but Lord Will refused to free Aemon forcing Baelor instead to offer a prayer for his cousin and swear that he would return for him. Many generations since have wondered just what Prince Aemon must have thought of this, seeing his reedy-voiced, slender cousin, haggard, with bare and bleeding feet, making this promise, one that seemed unlikely that he would be able to keep, and yet, Baelor pressed on and survived the Boneway. This alone surprised all at court, as the Boneway had proven the undoing of many thousands before him. The crossing of the arid desert between the northern foothills and the scourge on foot, practically alone, nearly undid King Baelor. And yet, with his faith, he persevered and kept on going, despite his worsening condition. It was an arduous journey and a long journey, but by some miracle or by the grace of the Seven, he managed to survive it, making it all the way to Sunspear. Once there, he was able to meet with the Prince of Dawn in what came to be considered the first of the miracles of the reign of King Baelor, whom after his journey became known as Baelor the Blessed. He succeeded in forging a peace with Dawn that lasted throughout his reign, but ultimately, like most pieces with Dawn, one side or the other would inevitably break it. As part of the terms of the peace agreement between the prince and the king, the king agreed that his younger cousin, Daron, grandson of his hand, Prince Viserys, and the son of Viserys' eldest son, Prince Aegon, should be betrothed to the Princess Maria, eldest child of the Prince of Dawn. Both were still but children at this time, so the marriage was to take place when they both came of age. Over the next few days, King Baelor held several more long meetings with the Prince of Dawn in the old palace of Sunspear. The prince offered Baelor a galley 
to take him back to King's Landing, along with an escort of guards to protect his person in place of his King's Guard, whom it must be recalled were left in King's Landing. The young king insisted that the seven had commanded him to walk back the same way he had came. Some in the Dornish court rightly feared that Prince Viserys would take this as a new cause for war, when, not if, Baelor inevitably perished upon the road. While the king had been rested and fed, he was still in a poor condition, with few thinking he had the strength to make the journey. To try and combat this problem, the Prince of Dawn made every effort to make sure that the Dornish lords along Baelor's proposed route home would be open and hospitable to him. The king left Sunspit alone at dawn, heading back into the endless red sands of dawn, making his way home to King's Landing on foot, the exact same way he had come before. But there was a dragon fire lit inside the heart of Baelor the Blessed. The king had made a promise to his cousin, Prince Aemon the Dragon Knight, and he was determined to keep that promise. The walk back to King's Landing was just as long and dangerous for King Baelor as the journey to Sunspear was, if not more so. When he mounted the Boneway and word of it reached Sunspear, many at the court of the Prince of Dawn were very surprised that King Baelor had made it that far. In many ways, the hardest part of the King's journey was over. There was one very testing task left for the King. To keep the promise he had made to the imprisoned Prince Aemon, the Dragon Knight, to return for him and free him from his captivity at the hand of Lord Will. Given the time that had passed since Baelor had last seen the prince, there was a strong possibility that Aemon could have died from exposure to the harsh environment of Dawn. Now through the desert, King Baelor turned his attention to recovering Prince Aemon from his imprisonment. During one of his many meetings with the Prince of Dawn, to secure peace between the Seven Kingdoms and Dawn, King Baelor had asked the Dornish Prince to explicitly command the Dragon Knight's release, and this Lord Will accepted. But there was always an element of Dornish trickery hiding beneath the words of Lord Will. When King Baelor finally reached the castle of the Wills, the truth of this trickery would come to light, but King Baelor had expected as much. Lord Will, instead of freeing Prince Aemon himself, at the moment the Prince of Dawn commanded him to do so, he waited for the ragged, blessed king to reach his castle. When Baelor asked for Prince Aemon, Lord Will simply threw a rusted key at the feet of Baelor. This was the battered key to Aemon's cage. With a smirk, Lord Will told the king that the Dragon Knight was free to leave and gave Baelor an invitation to use the key. It was not going to be a simple case of unlocking the prince's cage, as Lord Will had made sure to make the task as difficult and perilous as possible, while at the same time technically obeying the command of his prince. The king was unmoved by the overconfidence of Lord Will, and showing no emotion, calmly walked towards the cage that held his cousin. It was only as he drew closer the king understood the game Lord Will had played. Aemon was still in his small cage, naked and exposed to the hot sun by day and the freezing winds at night. He looked sickly thin, with his lips dry and cracked from lack of water. His famous silver Targaryen hair was a tangled mat and filthy. The cage was exactly the same as it was when King Baelor had spoken to Aemon on his trip to Sunspear when he made the promise to return. However, there was now one key difference one that made the task of freeing him a perilous challenge. Lord Will had commanded that a deep pit to be dug beneath Aemon's cage. Placed within were countless deadly venomous vipers, the kind whose venom had been used by Dornish assassins and even the faceless men of Bravos for centuries. If bitten, there was a strong possibility the king and the prince would be as good as dead, and both Baelor and Aemon knew this. The Dragon Knight is said to have begged for the king to leave him, to go and seek aid from the Dornish marches instead. In all likelihood, by the time Baelor reached the nearest marcher lords of House Dondarrion, it would be too late for Aemon. But the Dragon Knight knew that by doing so, he'd be saving the life of his king. But King Baelor the Blessed truly lived up to his name in the events that followed. While there is some vagueness in what exactly occurred next, we do know from the limited sources we have two accounts of events. From the limited sources we have access to, we know that Baelor is to have simply smiled at his cousin with grace and calm. He told the Dragon Knight in his soft voice that the gods and his faith in them would protect him from any harm that may befall him. Then, Baelor, without a moment of hesitation, 
stepped into the pit of vipers before him, to all but certain death. Later, the singers claimed that the vipers parted as the king approached, forming a clear path to his cousin's cage, bowing their head to the blessed king as he passed them. But thanks to the few historical sources we do have, we know that the truth of the matter was very much otherwise. Baylor was said to have been bitten half a dozen times while crossing to the cage. No path opened up. There was no bowing heads. Baylor did somehow reach Eamon's cage, and though he opened it, he nearly collapsed, but not before the Dragon Knight was able to thrust the door open and pull his cousin from the pit. It is said that with his strength waned, Eamon struggled to even manage that. The wheels are said to have laid wages as Prince Eamon struggled to climb out of the cage, with Baylor flung across his back. And perhaps it was their cruelty that spurred him to climb to the top of the cage and make the long leap to safety. Prince Eamon carried Baylor halfway down the boneway before the village septon in the Dornish mountains gave him clothing and a donkey on which to carry the comatose king. Eventually, Eamon reached the watchtowers of the Dondarians and was then conducted to Blackhaven, where the local maester cared for the king as best as his abilities allowed, before sending them on to Storm's End for further, more skilled treatment. And all the while, it is said Baylor was wasting away, still lost to the world. He only regained consciousness briefly on the way to Storm's End, and then only to mutter a prayer. It was half a year or more before he was well enough to travel on to King's Landing, and in all that time, Prince Viserys managed the realm as King's Hand, maintaining Baylor's peace treaty with the Dornish. While the stories of the events at Castle Will often focus on the bravery of King Baylor the Blessed in his fearless and faithful rescue of his cousin, with many small folk retelling the tales of the singers rather than the historical truth. Because in that historical telling, Aemon the Dragon Knight must also be applauded for his bravery in saving the king from his fate in the Pit of Vipers, and despite his poor physical condition, somehow managing to carry him for several days to help and safety. While the focus of this tale is always on Baylor, the truth is both the Blessed King and the Dragon Knight showed bravery, faith and loyalty, saving each other that day. The lords and small folk across Westeros celebrated when King Baylor at last seated himself on the Iron Throne and his reign began in earnest after his perilous trip to Dawn, rescue of his cousin Aemon from captivity and his recovery from the injuries sustained in the process. Few at this time could have foreseen the kind of king Baylor would become over the next 10 years and the impact he would have on Westeros and House Targaryen. Baylor's interests were not of the trivial matters of ruling, instead it remained firmly on the Seven and his devout faith. Of course, this pleased the likes of the High Septon of the Faith, but not so much his hand, Prince Viserys, or the entirety of the Small Council. The first of his new edicts Baylor made must have caused consternation among those who had been used to Aegon III's sober rule. King Daron's benign neglect of his wider role as king and Prince Viserys's shrewd stewardship as Hand of the King, having been married in 160 AC to the eldest of his younger sisters, Dana, the king proceeded to convince the High Septon to dissolve the marriage, a very uncommon request and something not easily done. His argument was it had been contracted before he was king and that the marriage had never actually been consummated, with the king supposedly providing proof of this. After the union between King Baylor and the short-lived Queen Dana was dissolved by his High Holiness, the High Septon, Baylor went further than anyone predicted he would by placing Dana and his other two younger sisters, Raina and Elena, into their own secluded Court of Beauty within the Red Keep, in what became known in the history books and to the common folk as the Maiden Vault. The king announced that he wished to preserve their innocence from the wickedness of the world and the lusts of imperious men. But the most popular theory as to why Baylor took such drastic action was Baylor himself feared the temptation of his sister's beauty, so much so it would distract him from his true purpose of serving the faith, though the hand of the king, Prince Viserys, the three princesses themselves, and other members of the court protested, including the whole small council. But the deed was done, and the will of the king was the will of the king, and could not be stopped. And so, the princesses were hidden away in the heart of the Red Keep, accompanied only by maidens, that lords and knights from across Westeros, sent to the Red Keep to curry favour with the pious King Valor. Even more protests 
came soon after, when Baylor announced yet another hugely unpopular edict. Again, one that not a single person could sway him from. King Baylor wanted to outlaw prostitution within King's Landing, and no one could impress on him how much trouble that would cause, not only with his small folk, but the rich businessmen in the city, and of course the many important men at court who frequented such women. More than 1,000 whores and their children, it is said, were rounded up and put out of the city into the countryside surrounding it. Many, even within the faith whom supported the outlawing of prostitution, felt that Baylor's handling of the women and children, condemning so many of them to die slow hungry death by removing them from the city, was unnecessary and a step too far. The unrest that followed in the weeks and months after was something King Baylor chose not to acknowledge as he busied himself with his newest project, a great sept which would be built on the top of Asenia's hill, a sept that he said he had seen in a vision. So was the great sept first envisioned, though it would not be completed until many years after Baylor's death. Ultimately, some have wondered if the king's near death in dawn from numerous viper bites had not affected his mind in some way. He was after all in a coma for several days and near death for many weeks. As the years of his reign slowly progressed, his decisions grew even more zealous and erratic despite the efforts of Prince Viserys to control the more zealous of his edicts. But despite the outlawing of prostitution, the small folk did indeed come to love him as the blessed king emptied the treasuries regularly to fund his charitable acts, including the year when he donated a loaf of bread daily to every man and woman in the city. The lords of the realm were beginning to grow uneasy at the edicts of Baylor and the sheer cost of them to the realm. The king had not only ended his marriage to Dana, but he had made sure he would never wed again by taking a septon's vow, aided and abetted by a high septon who was becoming increasingly influential in the kingdom. Many felt it was not Baylor ruling the kingdom, but really the High Septum, the king's edicts becoming more and more concerned with spiritual matters at the expense of material, as well as including his efforts to require those in the citadel to use doves, not ravens, to carry their messages, and his attempts to prove exemptions from taxation for those who ensured the virtue of their daughters through the use of chastity belts. But even so, for many, the Septon's vow was the most dangerous part. Without Baylor marrying and fathering children, the issue of the succession came into question, as he would therefore father no heirs. So even long before Baylor's death, there was discussions of who would take the crown once the king had perished. The most obvious answer of whom would be Baylor's heir was his hand, Prince Viserys, the younger brother of the late king Aegon III. Failing that, the crown would in theory pass to Viserys' eldest son, Prince Aegon. Little could anyone at the time have predicted the consequences on House Targaryen of Baelor not having an heir of his own and the crown eventually passing to Viserys and later his cousin Aegon. One unfortunate aspect of Baelor's zealotry was his insistence on burning books, though most books might hold little that is worth knowing and some might even hold matters that are dangerous. Destroying knowledge is a painful thing regardless. That Baylor had the former court fool Mushroom's testimony of the events of the dance of the dragons burned is no great surprise, given the rabid and scandalous content within, but Septon Bath's unnatural history. However mistaken some of Bath's conclusions, it was work of one of the brightest minds of the Seven Kingdoms ever saw. Bath's study and alleged practices of higher arts proved enough to win Baylor's enmity and the destruction of his work even though the unnatural history contains much that is neither controversial nor wicked. It is only fortunate for us that fragments have survived today, so that the law within was not wholly lost. There is still some hope. There are copies of the full book in the libraries of the Lords of Westeros, or even in the Far East in Essos. The reign of Baelor the Blessed is a puzzling point in history, and one heavily discussed by scholars and historians. On the one hand, it is undeniable that many of Baylor's religiously motivated decrees impacted and damaged the lives of many, with his ban on prostitution in the city of King's Landing resulting in the deaths of many starving women and children. But at court, given the scandalous nature of the topic, much of this would go unspoken. 
Again, Baylor did indeed imprison his sisters in the Maiden Vault with pushback from his small council and hand at first. But ultimately, many of those voices became silent. Whilst the building of the Great Set did provide jobs for the builders and small folk of the city, the cost to the crown was huge. Money the kingdom did not have. Even more worrying was the growing influence of the High Septon on the mind of the king, with some beginning to wonder if it was the Faith who now truly ruled the Seven Kingdoms. But for every negative impact of Baelor, there would be a decree that could be viewed as positive and perhaps good. For example, Baelor cared deeply about the small folk, and over his reign did much to improve their lives and uplift them with charitable acts. Thus why, Baelor is forever debated as whether he was a good or bad king by historians. But what can be said, is his devotion to the faith and refusal to marry by taking a septon's vow, indeed would set House Targaryen and Westeros on a path of bloodshed in the later years of his reign. The king's focus on his faith became all-consuming. He spent hours talking to the High Septon and numerous other key members of the faith, becoming almost absent at small council meetings, leaving Prince Viserys with the job of almost effectively ruling the realm. Baelor began to spend more and more time fasting and praying. As king, he saw the sins of his subjects as his own responsibility. He began attempting to make up for all the sins and offences he believed he and his subjects were committing against the Seven on a daily basis. Given the population of King's Landing, let alone the whole of Westeros, this weighed heavily on the king's shoulders. It was when the High Septon died, one of Baelor's most erratic and damaging acts as king happened. Without any dissent or questions of the king, they promptly elected Baelor's choice to the office of High Septon. This new High Septon was a simple, common man named Pate, who was a gifted worker in stone and had apparently been working on the Great Sept. While a gifted stonemason, Pate was without letters, simple-minded and unable to recall even the most simple of prayers. He found himself unable to conduct most of the duties that the High Septon was expected to do. It was a blessing, perhaps, that this lackwit High Septon only survived a year before a fever took him, or perhaps not, for King Baelor, by the time of the death of Pate, had become convinced that the gods had given an eight-year-old boy, a street urchin, but more likely a horse son, the power to perform miracles. Baelor claimed to have seen the boy speaking with doves that answered him in voices of men and women, the voices of the seven, according to Baelor. This, he declared, should be the next high septum, not learning from the lackwit High Septon. Again, the most devout did as the king desired, and so the youngest High Septon to ever wear the crystal crown was chosen, an eight-year-old boy from the streets of King's Landing. Many began to see the decrees of Baelor as nothing more than a joke, with some in the faith beginning to question the wisdom of blindly following the king's wishes. However, these voices were very quickly silenced, with few jumping up to take their place. The eventual birth of Daemon Waters, the base-born child of Daena Targaryen, by a father she refused to name, but whom the realm would later learn was none other than her cousin, Prince, later King Aegon, led to another fit of fasting by the king to repent for his sister and cousin's sins. He had already nearly killed himself some years before, when he fasted for a moon's turn following the deaths of his cousin, Princess Nerys's twins, shortly after that delivery. This time, Baelor took it further yet, refusing anything but water and taking only enough bread to still the cries of his stomach. Forty days he kept his regime. On the 41st day, he was found collapsed at the altar of the mother. Grandmaster Munkin did what he could to heal the king. So too did the eight-year-old High Septon, but his miracles were at an end. The king joined the Seven in the 10th year of his reign in 171 AC, aged 30 years of age. Malicious rumours then followed in the wake of the death of Baelor the Blessed and the ascension of Viserys, begun, some say, by the pen of Lady Maya of House Stokeworth, which suggested that Viserys poisoned the king in order to finally gain the throne after a decade and more of waiting. Others have suggested that Viserys poisoned Baelor for the good of the realm, since the Septon King had come to believe that the Seven called on him to convert all of the unbelievers in his realm. This would have led to a war with the North and the Iron Islands that would have caused great turmoil and split the Seven Kingdoms of Westeros for all of time. How much of this is true is debated by historians, with no real consensus being found. But all we can say for sure is the Blessed King died 
and in his wake, King Viserys II Targaryen, the youngest son of Rhaenyra Targaryen and Daemon Targaryen, and the younger brother of the late King Aegon III. One of the most infamous aspects of the reign of King Baelor the Blessed was his imprisonment of his three sisters in a maiden vault in order to protect their virtue, but as some claim, also prevent himself from acting on his desires. Each of the three women who spent years of their life in this maiden vault were each very different people, but all bonded by their shared circumstance. At first, there was pushback, especially from Dana, towards her brother when he declared his sisters would be placed in the vault, and even some of the small council dissented for a time. But at the end of the day, the king's will was the king's will, no matter how erratic, and thus the centers soon fell quiet, as the three princesses were placed into the vault. Dana Targaryen, by far is the most famed of the three sisters of Baelor the Blessed, and was the most loved by the small folk and courtiers alike. For her stunning beauty, as much as her fierce courage and willfulness, born in 145 AC, Dana was the third child and eldest daughter of King Aegon III and Queen Daenerys Velaryon. A Targaryen to the bone, she was strong, beautiful and willful, and like the rest of her siblings, had a Valyrian look. Her long silver gold hair, was thick and curly, an untamed mane that framed her heart-shaped face and her sparkling purple eyes. To top it off, she had a fearless, I'll dare anything, smile. Dana often dressed dramatically. As a child, she wore black in emulation of her father. After her brother, Baylor, vowed to consummate their marriage, she changed to all white. She always wore the golden three-headed dragon pendant she had inherited from her father. At court, she wore it on a fine golden chain, when she disguised herself as a peasant, she hung it on a leather thong and hid it beneath her clothes. Supposedly, she even wore it while bathing and when making love. She was known as a skilled horsewoman and a fearsome archer, particularly with the Dornish bow her late brother, King Daron, had brought back from his conquests, and she was well practiced at riding rings, though she was never allowed to ride in a tawny, despite her efforts to the contrary. Dana quickly became known as the Defiant, for she was the most relentless of the three sisters in her imprisonment in the Maiden Vault at the hands of her brother, King Baelor. It is said that on three separate occasions she managed to escape, disguised as a servant or one of the small folk. She even contrived towards the end of Baelor's reign to get herself with child, though some might say it would have been better had she been less defiant for all the trouble that son brought to the realm in the years to come. In late 170 AC, she gave birth to a bastard son, whom she named Daemon, after her grandfather, Prince Daemon Targaryen, the rogue prince. She refused to name the father, who was suspected and eventually revealed to have been her cousin, Prince Aegon, later King Aegon. But the identity of Daemon's father was not revealed until 182 AC. The birth of Dana's son was one of the direct causes that led the fast of King Baelor that claimed his life. He fasted for 40 days, taking only water and a little bit of bread. On the 41st day of his fast, he was found collapsed before an altar of the mother. After Baelor's death in 171 AC, there were some amongst the small folk and the lords who felt that the Iron Throne should now pass to Dana, as she was King Aegon III's eldest surviving child. However, Dana had been isolated for a decade in the Maiden Vault, which had left her and her sisters without any powerful allies. In addition, the memories of the Dance of the Dragons and of Rhaenyra Targaryen, the last woman to sit the Iron Throne, left many leery of the idea of a ruling queen. As well as Dana, she was seen by many as being wild, unmanageable and wanton due to her giving birth to a bastard son the year before, while at the same time still refusing to name the father the presidents of the Great Council of 101 AC, and then the Dance of the Dragons were cited, and the claim that Dana and her sisters were set aside, so the crown passed to their uncle, Viserys II Targaryen. The impact that Princess Dana Targaryen had on Westeros and its people cannot be understated in the least. While she was a pleasant girl, who would never have foresaw the impact of her actions, her defiance would in years to come be the root cause of the bloodshed to soak the fields of the Seven Kingdoms once more as the House of the Dragon tore itself apart anew in a civil war as infamous as the Dance of the Dragons. While it was a more conventional war than the Dance of the Dragons, it would plague House Targaryen till its downfall at the hands of Robert Baratheon. Daenerys' bastard son with her cousin, King Aegon IV, would later become Daemon Blackfire. 
when legitimised by his father, eventually starting what would become the subsequent Blackfire rebellions. While Dana could not have known what her son would go on to become, and cannot be held responsible for neither Damon's or King Aegon IV's choice to legitimise all his baseborn children, it can be said for sure that the birth of Damon Blackfire in 170 AC is one of the defining moments in the history of Westeros and of House Targaryen, with its direct impact still being felt well into the Baratheon era of Westeros, 113 years later. For Princess Dana, was perhaps the most infamous of the sisters of King Baelor the Blessed. Thanks to the actions of her son, Daemon Blackfire, the king had two other sisters who each played their own role in the history of Westeros. Princess Rhaena was almost as pious and religious as King Baelor, and in time, like her brother, joined the faith and became a scepter. Born in 147 AC, she was two years younger than Dana. Rhaena was said to be just as lovely as her sister, but hers was a softer, sweeter, more feminine beauty. Though she was not plump, her body was more rounded than Dana's. Rhaena's hair was more gold than silver and was always carefully coiffed and combed. She had soft, kind eyes and a shy, sweet smile. It is said that out of the three sisters of Baelor, who were placed in the Maiden Vault, Rhaena resisted the least. Given that, in personality she differed from her older sister, where Dana was willful, wild and adventurous. Rhaena was dutiful, meek and passive, for the most part, thus why it was not a surprise to anyone when she chose to join the faith. She loved to dress in white and gold, and was very fond of lace trim on her sleeves and bodices. She loved to sew and do needlework and often it was seen embroidering religious scenes on her own clothing. This was in stark contrast to her younger sister. Princess Elena was the youngest of the three sisters. She was much more willful than Reyna, but not quite as beautiful as either of her sisters. Born in 150 AC, at the age of 11, she was described as a skinny little thing, awkward and angular, shy and charming by turns. However, her beauty matured as she grew older, with her eyes a soft lilac, her mouth thin-lipped and often angry. Her hair was perhaps her feature which stood out the most. It was platinum white, with a bright golden streak down the middle, an unusual colour even for the children of House Targaryen. She always wore it long, pulled back and braided, and was always being told it was her crowning beauty. However, she cut off her braid to defy her brother, Baelor, for imprisoning her in the Maiden Vault. Then on, she wore her hair short for years. As a child, Elena liked to dress in black, simply because her older sister Dana also dressed in black. In character, she had more than a little of Dana's willfulness, as she would prove when she grew older. Elena was also shrewd and intelligent, especially with money. When she was placed in the Maiden Vault, and after she had cut her long platinum hair with the golden streak running through it, it is said she sent it to her brother, pleading for her freedom with a promise that she swore she would be too ugly to tempt any man now. Of course, her pleas fell on the deaf ears of her zealous brother, whose obsession with the faith had begun to consume him. There was never any chance he would have relented and allowed the freedom of his sisters, despite their pleas and promises to remain faithful. Like the rest of her sisters, once King Baelor died in 171 AC, after being found collapsed at an altar, conducting yet another fast for the apparent sins of his sister, Dana. All three of the king's sisters were freed from the Maiden Vault by their uncle, King Viserys II. Once free from the Maiden Vault, Elena would go on to live a tumultuous life, but she would ultimately outlive all of her siblings, dying at some point after 220 AC. She, in the end, followed her elder sister, Dana's footsteps, when in the period between 171 and 176 AC, she bore bastard twins, a boy and a girl she named John and Jane Waters. Their father turned out to be none other than Lord Alan Valarian, the Oaken Fist. This caused much scandal and tension at court, as it must be remembered that at this time, Alan was still married to Bela Targaryen, the half-sister of the late King Aegon III, and cousin to Elena's mother, Daenerys. While we know little of the particulars of their relationship and how it came to be, it was said that Alan had been in love with Elena for some time. It is believed that Elena hoped to one day marry Alan, but a year after his disappearance at sea, during his final voyage, she gave up hope and accepted he was lost and agreed to marry elsewhere. Due to gaps in court records, it is unknown whether Lord Alan ever knew about his bastards 
or whether the children were born after he left on his final voyage, from which he never returned. Ultimately, the true-born son of John Waters became a great knight, going on to form House Longwaters, whose line still exists into the Baratheon era of Westeros, with his descendant, Renifer Longwaters, the current chief underjailer in the Red Keep's Black Cells. Given House Longwaters' descent from two parents with a long line of Valyrian ancestry, the members of House Longwaters bear the traditional Valyrian look. Elena, in the end, was thrice wed. Her first marriage in 176 AC was to a wealthy but aged Ossifer Plum, who is said to have died while consummating the marriage. Nevertheless, she conceived a child during that singular occasion. There are later scandalous rumours, whose sources are not known, that came to suggest that Lord Plum in fact died at the sight of his new bride in her nakedness, and that the child conceived that night was by her cousin Aegon. He who later became King Aegon the Unworthy. However, many argue that while Aegon had a clear reputation for fathering bastards, even on his own cousins, there is no real proof to suggest that that was the case with Elena. Even so, Viserys Plum was born in 176 AC and would go on to become Lord when he came of age. A descendant of Viserys Plum crossed the narrow sea and became the ancestor of Brown Ben Plum. Elena's second marriage was at the behest of Aegon the Unworthy's successor, King Daron the Good. Daron wed her to his master of coin, Ronald Penrose, and the union led to four more children, Robin, Lena, Jocelyn, and Joy Penrose. It is said that during this time, given Elena's skill with numbers, that she became known as the true master of coin, for her husband was said to be a good and noble lord, but one without great faculty for numbers. Due to this, she swiftly grew in influence and was trusted by King Daron in all things as she laboured on his behalf and on that of the realm. Her third marriage came after 209 AC and was one of her own choice after she fell in love to Michael Manwoody, a Dornishman who had attended Princess Mara at her court. Manwoody, in early life, studied at the Citadel and was a cultured man of great wit and learning who had become a trusted servant of King Daron. He was sent to Bravos to negotiate with the Iron Bank on several occasions and there is a record of a correspondence between him and the keyholders of the Iron Bank, sealed with his seal and signed with his name, but apparently in the hand of Elena. Elena married Sir Michael apparently with Daron's blessing, not long after her second husband had died. Elena said in her later years that it wasn't his intelligence that made her love Sir Manwoody, but his love of music. He was known to play the harp for her, and when he died, Elena commanded that his effigy be carved holding a harp, and not the sword and spurs of knighthood, as is most common. Music